Okay. So you have two. Um, so, the, so for the record, we're in here from Legislative here. Council. Okay. You have two amendments in front of you. One of them has a heading at the top that says no LWOP, mm -hmm. no life without parole. The other says LWOP for aggravated. Okay. Um, the one that says no LWOP is the version that you looked at last week. Right. Um, so there are no changes to that version. The one that says LWOP for aggravated establishes that um, a court can't impose a sentence of life without the possibility of parole for any crime other than aggravated murder. So if you'd like to, we can go through this draft quickly if you'd like. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I mean, it's just, that's really the only difference, right? Yes, the, 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 we've got the same provision in there for the um, de facto life without parole, which is section two consecutive sentences. Um, what's new is section three, it's that life without parole sentence prohibited section. We've just amended that to provide that, um, as is true under existing law, nobody under 18 years of age can be sentenced to life without parole. And it adds nobody who's committed any offense other than aggravated murder can be sentenced to life without parole. Okay. Do we um, have and a list? it also renames the, I'm sorry to interrupt you, it renames the act as well. Do we have a list of what aggro, what constitutes aggro? Yeah, I know we did it someplace. It's in the bill. Um, so if you look at page three of, um, your no LWOP draft. No that's that. LWOP. That's the aggravated murder statute, is there? The murder was committed by the defendants in custody of the sentence for murder or aggravated murder. Okay. At prior commencement of the trial for aggravated and convicted of another aggravated murder. <clears throat> the defendant also committed another murder. The defendant knowingly created a great risk of death to another person the person. Murder was committed for the purpose of avoiding preventing lawful arrest by law. Blah, blah, blah. There are eight potential. Committed by, by a person purpose. hired for such purpose in return of anything for value. No. Oh, yeah, and then the firefighter one. A firefighter, etc. Committed by a, a perpetrator attempting to perpetrate sexual assault or aggravated sexual assault. Mm -hmm. Not a, not, not a, certainly bad average. Well, yes. I, I mean, it, these aren't ands, these are ors. Mm -hmm. So at the time of the murder, the defendant um, committed another murder or created a great risk of death to some. So the one in Townsend, for example, was she shot two people. So that's aggravated murder. Well, it, it depends on the state's attorney and what the state. Well, it is aggravated charges. because she is she was one of the people on the list uh, of the 16 people that we were given. Yeah. I mean, she yeah. shot two people. She'll probably never ever shoot anybody again. But well. I, I I mean. So these aren't well, she all. She wouldn't be allowed to have a firearm under the. <laughs> right, so, but I mean, these aren't all really horrible people. The, I, I shouldn't have said that. I mean, these aren't all, all these people that commit aggravated murder aren't necessarily horrible people. The, um, well, you, so that's all I'm saying. Um, you know, we can hear from. Yep witnesses regarding this proposal. Uh, is that any other questions for Bryn? Sorry. Uh, next is Mary Jane Ashford. Ainsworth. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Uh, MJ. Uh, di director of the Parole Board. Good morning. Good morning. Mary Jane. Good to see you again on another bill. Now. I know. I hadn't seen you in years, and now all of a sudden it's a daily. <laughs> I, I hit a DOC for many years. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, Mary Jane Ainsworth, director of the Parole Board. Um, the Parole Board doesn't really have a stance on this bill um, either way. Um, I did look at the new drafts last night, and I noticed that the part, the, the original as it was introduced, I had some issues with potentially around after 25 years. Yeah. The, when you go back to the ones that are already sentenced without life parole, without parole. But other than that, the only part that I saw was on the no 
LWOP draft on page four, okay. um, lines 18 through 20. It takes out where they shall not be eligible for parole. They, that was stricken out, but it leaves that they're not eligible for furlough. I don't know if it makes a difference because there is a different, there's an additional vetting process to go on parole, but I just wanted to point that out, that there was a little confusion about whether they'd be eligible for furlough or not. And I don't know if DOC would have a stance on that or not. What? There's no minimum term, so there. Right. Right. So, well, if there's no minimum term, how would they be eligible for parole? Mm -hmm. so yeah, that's a good question. I haven't looked at a lot of life without parole sentences in a long, long time. Do you have any idea how many of them there are currently? I think that I last heard there's approximately 15 of them currently. Any other questions for Jess? Thanks for making it in this morning. Oh, no problem. Thanks. It was my failures on my way through. <laughs> Thank you. He was here very early. Yeah. Uh, At 7.30. James Pepper, the state's attorneys and sheriffs. And So um, one of our, as I mentioned last time, one of our state's attorneys uh, would actually like, supports either proposal, would uh, prefer actually to be able to resentence certain folks. Um, the vast majority support uh, the leaving life without parole for aggravated murder. Um, <clears throat> that and uh, I haven't been able to get in touch with one of our state's attorneys, but I assume that he would support the leaving in places. How often do you have any idea how often it's charged and how often people are convicted for aggravated versus um, other forms of murder? You know, it's interesting. The most recent example is a case out of St. Johnsbury. Um, there was the case before that, um, the Laura Sobel case, was actually charged as aggravated murder, but then it was pled down to first degree murder on all charges because um, she was willing to agree to that so that she would have the option of arguing for something other than life without parole. Mm -hmm. And the state agreed to that. Um, they said that they were gonna argue for life without parole, but it wouldn't be, you know, they wouldn't be aggravated murder. Um, and, uh, her attorneys argued uh, for no life without parole, and the judge, um, Judge Pack, gave life without parole just on the Laura Solo killing, not the, for the three others, even though they were all first degree murder charges. Hmm. And were, were the Peru's sentenced on aggravated? Or? I, I think they were, yeah. I, I can, I have the form from DOC, which. They were the St. John's. They were the St. John's. The, I think they were on that list. Yeah. yeah. Um, so again, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to just rehash my testimony from last time, but we were strongly in favor of, of leaving it in place for the aggravated murder si situations, the very kind of once in a generation kind of situations. Um, you, you did ask me to propose some alternative language around the uh, concurrent sentencing for people under 25, because I think that the idea is you don't want to create de facto life sentences for people right. under 25. But I think that what you have in these drafts actually, it does that for sure, but it also impacts a huge amount of cases other than the, the de facto life sentence. The, 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 the 25, the 24-year-old or 19-year-old that's charged with 
both a misdemeanor and a felony or a, a lesser felony that the state wants to plead down, um, but wants just a little bit more than the maximum two years of supervision because if it's a serious felony. So what I was thinking as an alternative would be just to say that if there is a person that's charged with multiple offenses, he's under 25, that the aggregate minimum term can't be any longer and then just pick the number that you want. I mean, uh, so, you know, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, you know, just to say that the aggregate minimum term can't exceed this number. Um, so that you would never get to the de facto kind of stacking of, you know, 30, 50, 60, 70 years, you know, you wouldn't get to that point. Um, Take a Murdoch case, for example. He, he never murdered anybody, but he certainly, that, that what you're talking about, he's de facto life with her. Right, the ones where, you know, you have... He stacked up like 400 years. Yeah, like exactly. You know? And so, you know, I think that if you want to avoid that situation without creating impacting all of the kind of lower level felony cases, um, then you could just say just no aggregate minimum term shot, the aggregate minimum term can't exceed X and you just decide who that X is. I think he got like, you know, they, you know at his age, well, by the way, he's, he's asking for a compassionate release. He uh, says he's terminal ill. Who's that guy? Bernie Madoff. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> right. Your right. friend. Right, yeah. And all my investments. Your friendly father. <laughs> it, it, it's, an, you know, it's really has little to do with anything, but the Justice Center, who we've been working with so well, had a great deal of funding from the Jet Foundation. And the Jet Foundation was funded by Bernie Madoff. It was a, was one of his foundations, and they lost a significant amount of their um, non Bureau of Justice. Yet. Luckily, the Pew Center and some others stepped in. But I got to know this guy who worked for the foundation, and I, it was so sad. He was a really nice guy. I mean, he had nothing to do with all that Madoff did, but you know, so many people were back impacted by. Oh yeah. <coughs> Big, big, or particularly Jewish organizations in and around yeah. New York City. <coughs> anyway, so I can send that language to Brent. I have it actually yeah. drafted up. I, I just uh, I wasn't sure if that was part of the conversation today, but well, it, sh it really should be because yeah. you are de facto. Right. And you know, it was odd if somebody murdered two people, wasn't eligible for life without parole, but somebody else, yeah. you know, ended up with. So many sentences, and they were consecutive for non-violent crime. And you know, Alex Sobel reached out to me last night. I know he's on the list for later. I think he's he's in Florida, I believe. He's in Florida, right? He's a little nervous that this applies retroactively. I tried to tell him it doesn't. Um, but I think, you know, just if he... I think other than Senator Baruth, there hasn't been a push on this committee to go retroactive. Yeah, I think, just, I, I would hope that maybe Brent or someone can just make that clear to him at the beginning, because he was pretty worked up. Well, that was the communication between Brent and I in the draft. Mm -hmm. If you're tied by retroactive, it would be those 16 people, right? And yeah. We, yeah, I don't think we'd ever... I, I told him that, but uh, he just the way that he was reading the bill, he thought it. Well, was that's important. the version that he was reading. Yeah. Maybe if you can, I don't know if you can assure him again that that's not yeah. a proposal. Mm -hmm. I sent him the latest on that. Right? Yeah. I don't have anything else. On okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the sky was scheduled next, but I have not heard from him. Uh, I assume that he's. Oh. I'll try it, huh? I bet he's on his way. I haven't heard from him. Well, I'm going to try his phone number once more. And if I can't get it, I'll. Oh. Peggy, did you get my message? I did. Yeah. Do you have me? Do I look like a furnace repair man? William, do. Oh, I'm plugging in wires. <laughs> did you get it fixed? Right now. All right. Well, well the, land, the Borns guy, the service man, was there yesterday, but we got home still a problem.
or some some place. But anyway, the landlord son sends a text message. I copied it. I'll send. I'll show it to you. He goes, "How are you on furnaces?" <laughs> it's like not so hot. No. And, and couldn't you do some wiring? It's like what? <laughs> you know, pull out this wire, take this wire, press this, put this. In. It's like why didn't he come and do it? He doesn't live here. Oh, but the so, person you called has a voice yeah, now. Like, what well, are well, the two legs in? Do you want me to call it? Legs. He's bringing me into the wire. Sit <laughs> 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 down there and you're electrocuting yourself. <laughs> I got no plans, but Alice and Emily had gone down there and played around. Hello? Good morning. Good morning. This is Senator Dick Sears from Bennington County, and uh, you're joined by the Senate Judiciary Committee. We also have reporters in the room, as well as uh, you're being filmed. Obviously, they can't only see the phone, but there's a film of a, of a um, uh, community, pro Orca community Access. television yeah. um, here. So um, we are dealing with life without parole. Um, and uh, we know you went through a horrific time uh, a few years back. And uh, we look forward to your testimony. Um, we are not dealing with a bill that's retroactive, although one committee member uh, feels that we should consider it. But um, right now, the two drafts that we have in front of us do not include any retroactivity. So it wouldn't affect um, the case uh, of the woman who murdered your daughter. Okay, uh, uh, first, uh, as a sound check, can you hear me properly? Yes. yes. We can, thank, thank you. you. Okay, uh, that's a good start. Yep. Uh, uh, Chairman Sears and uh, members of the Judiciary Committee, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, <clears throat> I am Alex Sobel. I am the father of Lara Sobel, a state Vermont DCF worker who was murdered August 7th, 2015. Uh, I would much rather speak to you in person, but I'm in, currently in South Florida and uh, unable to do so. My daughter, Lara, was stalked and brutally assassinated by Jody Herring because she was doing her job protecting Vermont's most vulnerable children. Lara had been doing this work for the state for over 14 years, and she had recently testified in a court hearing that resulted in the adjudication and sheltering of Herring's young daughter. In acts of uh, planned vengeance, Herring first murdered three members of her own family, and then waited with a high-powered rifle in the parking lot for my daughter to leave work on that ill-fated Friday evening. I'll spare all of you the gruesome details of what followed. I'm sure you all know as all of the details were amply covered in the press during the arrest, the life without parole, sentencing, and the recently denied appeal almost one year to the day. I can't even begin to describe what our family has been through and said that the single greatest loss that a human being can experience is the loss of a child. This is so true. It doesn't just change you, it demolishes you, especially under these circumstances. But I did not just lose a daughter, she was brutally murdered, stolen from me and my family by an act of unprecedented evil from her birth through all the years as she grew into a competent, caring young woman, I was there for all the milestones, the birthdays, the family functions, the graduations, her wedding, birth of her children, and then I was there for her funeral. My granddaughters, Lara's children, Julia, who was 14, and Alana, who was 11, when their mother was murdered, still can't bring themselves to confront these issues. After more than four years, Alana, now 16, cannot bring herself to visit her mother's grave, nor has she ever seen her headstone. 
Both of my granddaughters will never have their mothers there for graduations. Mother's Day, to walk them down the aisles at their wedding or to be with them at the birth of their children. But today, as I speak to you, I speak to you not of vengeance. I come to speak to you about justice. I speak to you on behalf of all the victims. I speak to you in opposition to S-261 or any other bill to abolish life without parole sentencing. When an individual commits murder, there are many more victims than the deceased or direct family and friends of the deceased. Many more victims indeed. In the case of my daughter, Lara, the entire community was a victim. All over the state of Vermont and beyond, DCF workers began to look over their shoulders. If it happened once, why not again? One of their own was assassinated only because she was doing her job. The community suffered as the DCF experienced documented difficulties performing their job. Additionally, a witness was murdered as the direct result of her testifying in open court. That alone made the entire justice system the victim. There are so many victims, always. In passing the life without parole sentence for Herring, Judge Pack made the point that judges, prosecutors, witnesses, law enforcement, and DCF workers must feel safe and protected if society is to function. He plainly stated that the murder of Lara Sobel was system threatening and demanded no less a sentence than life without parole. Here, right now, it's important to note that Herring was neither tried nor convicted of aggravated murder for my daughter Lara or the three members of Herring's family. Yet, the life without parole sentence was warranted on so many levels. Although a killing of a firefighter EMT or public safety officer performing his or her duty is clearly defined in Vermont Criminal Code as, quote, aggravated murder, unquote. The murder of a DCF worker, likewise performing her duties, is not considered aggravated under Vermont law. Just moments before this phone call, I received the latest version of the proposed S-261, and I have not really had the opportunity to review the bill as it now stands. However, as I previously stated, I oppose any version of the bill to abolish life without parole sentencing, and I would now like to address some of the specific points that, I, that have been discussed during the past few weeks. The committee is considering carving out of the bill aggravated murder. On the surface, that looks like a concession to, law, to the law and order argument. Although upon deeper analysis, that proves not to be the case. That exclusion would present its own inequity. Could a single murder that does not meet one of the eight specific aggravating requirements of the, of the Vermont Criminal Code be so egregious that it cries out for life without parole sentencing. More egregious than aggravated murder? How could that be? I say, why not? It happened in the case of the murder of my daughter. Although Herring murdered four people in one of the most heinous crimes in the history of the state of Vermont, under this aspect of your proposed bill, Herring would be ineligible to receive a life without parole sentence. However serious and brutal as aggravated murder may be, unfortunately, there can be some brutal murders that can actually exceed the aggravated threshold in brutality yet fall short of the exact definition in the Vermont Code. Additionally, I've been told your committee is considering compassionate release applying to those serving life without parole sentence. 
Anyone serving a life without parole sentence is by definition supposed to serve the remainder of their life in prison, not just until they become ill enough to meet a subjective and changing threshold for release. The rest of their life means the rest of their life. Uh, actually, we're not considering um, compassionate relief for those persons who have been convicted with for life without well, parole. I'm, I'm, I'm talking, I, I can talk about going forward also, because I think it, it's valid. The point oh, is no. valid, not just going back. Remember, I'm not, this is not all about Jody Herring. This is about setting up, uh, setting up a, a, a particular law that, that is, uh, that is uh, mandata mandatory sentencing, as well as other aspects. <laughs> Excuse me of the law. No, I understand. But, but I'd like to I'd like to point out um, in when we talk about compassionate release, even going forward, um, I would uh, remember the terrorist from the Lockerbie bombing and the results of his compassionate release. If you don't recall, the terrorist Ali uh, El Magrahi, I believe his name was, was convicted in the Scottish court for placing the bomb aboard Flight 103 and killing 270 people. After serving eight years in the Scottish prison, he, was, he received a compassionate release according to Scottish law because he had been diagnosed with terminal prostate cancer. To the chagrin of the rest of the free world, he returned home to Libya to, re, to a hero's welcome and lived another three years in a luxurious villa. That didn't work out too well for compassionate release. I have also had discussions about whether S-261 would apply to those previously convicted and presently serving life without parole sentences. I think you addressed uh, in the beginning the retroactivity of it, but um, uh, to that point, it's, um, it's uh, undoubtedly you, you know by now where I stand on that issue. I will remind you that many of these cases involved plea deals and would reopen many cases for retrial. I think it's a bad idea for many reasons. Legal, maybe, maybe not. Not for me to say, but my guess would be probably not legal. In short, I, I feel strongly that limiting the judicial discretion in criminal sentencing by legislation, the flawed idea to begin with, which becomes further weakened by trying to clarify where it applies where it does not. Statutory mandated, mandated sentencing has time and time again proven problematic in our society. I believe sentencing must, and others believe sentencing must be left to the judiciary and its inherent appeal system and not removed by otherwise well-meaning legislation. Life without parole sentence is never handed down lightly and not without appeal. If our society is to function, there needs to be criminal sentencing that is proportional to the crime and acts as a requisite deterrent, a deterrent vitally needed by all Vermont law enforcement and judiciary. Again, I speak not of vengeance, but out of justice and the need to protect the victims, not just the obvious friends and family, but the entire community. We were all the victims when Lara was murdered. There are so many victims. While it is noble and certainly fashionable today to pursue human rights at all levels, and I certainly agree with that, the rights of those convicted of murder must never supersede the rights of the victims, all of the victims. There are so many victims. Again, thank you for the opportunity to share the views with the committee, and I open to any questions or comments or whatever. I've been very clear, Mr. Sobel, and thank you for your willingness to come forward and have that discussion with us. Obviously, all of us, as well as the state of Vermont, were shocked at the horrific crime. I do want to make a point that um, as difficult as the, uh, as this period of time was and continues to be for us, when this happened, we we would most uh, most wonderfully supported by the entire state, 
the residents, the citizens, the government, state government, um, everyone, from the governor right down, right down the line. We couldn't have made it without you. Thank you. I, I don't really have any questions, um, but our, the, the compassionate release provision that you're speaking of was in, is in a, is being contemplated in a bill which would allow for a compassionate release of persons, but is expressly uh, prohibits anyone with life without parole for being considered for a compassionate release for many of the reasons that you articulated or why we put it that way. Um, one, I might, I might add, and, one has to be just, yeah. a, bit, a bit careful, again, the slippery slope because of the, um, the uh, just to use McGrahi as a as a, an example, he was he was convicted only of only of 27 years. He was not life without parole, right. but he was released as under the compassionate right. release law of right. the Scottish government. But in Vermont, under the provision that we're contemplating in the bill, um, it still has to go through the parole board, which could refuse. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that it'd be automatic. Again, but one one really has to be careful when they when you I get into subjective subjective definitions. Um, how ill is ill, and how terminal is terminal, and I guess in one way in one way we're all terminal. It's just a matter of when. Yep. Well, terminal okay. terminal illness is actually defined um, pretty clearly as eighteen months. Um, by the medical community. But again, it's a subjective evaluation. Yeah. yeah. Any questions? Any other questions? Mr. Sobel, any other comments? No, um, only that if any of, um, going forward, if any of um, members of the committee or yourself, uh, Chairman Sears, if you have any issues that you want discuss with me um, I'm readily available and I um, and I welcome the opportunity to uh, to contribute something going forward in some ways it helps me cope with what's happened in the past mm -hmm. I think we understand that thank you very much um, on one bright note you're in Florida so you're not having the <laughs> snow that we're having today here in I was I was contemplating um, flying up um, for the um, to testify, but um, I thought about it for about a nanosecond. <laughs> Certainly a good decision, and one member of the committee, unfortunately from Burlington, that hasn't made it in yet. Um, so I don't know whether the interstate's closed or what's going on. But um, we had actually uh, we also have a witness from. Uh, we, uh, we, spent, um, we, we spent last uh, February, I said the appeal took place um, one year, it was actually uh, February 20th, I believe, 2019, so we were there for a week in February. Not, um, it's not Montpelier's finest weather. No, no it's not. Um, well, thank you, sir, and we do appreciate your testimony. and. Uh, it is timely and it gives lends another voice to our decision making. And, sure. uh, and I'm pleased again, as I said, I'm pleased to be able to do it. Uh, Peggy has my uh, telephone yeah. number, and um, I welcome any further comments that you uh, you may have or questions. Okay. Well, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much again for the opportunity. You're welcome. Bye. 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 -bye. Who do we have? So this is Amin. He's the um, he's one of the California witnesses from Skyler and from Susan. Yeah. Did Susan want to testify this morning, Do you want to testify, Susan? I can say yeah. I can say a few. Well, I mean, I want I want to. She's come all the way from California. Yeah. Yeah. And these are her two. Oh, okay. These well, are why don't you introduce well. them? And sure. So that you know them and tell us a little bit about why we're hearing. Why are we hearing from both of them? Oh, they're completely different. They're completely different. These are the two names. Huh? Okay. Skyler didn't make it. Huh? 
Uh, okay. <laughs> Well, hopefully we can get him on the phone. Um, well, good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Um, I guess just for the record, my name is Susan Lawrence. I'm the uh, founder and CEO for the Center for Life Without Parole Studies. And I'd like to introduce the two witnesses that I've asked to. Maybe you should call. We'll call him first. OK. Early, he's in California. <laughs> okay. I hope they're up. It's six o'clock there. Yeah, I know the second person is, is up. I don't I hope the is up. Maybe we should try this. If he doesn't answer, we can try the second person next. Okay. 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 Judiciary Committee in Montpelier, Vermont. Yes. And your name is? Azim Kamisa. Oh, okay. Um, we're dealing with a bill that would eliminate life without parole. Correct. Um, and uh, we understand that you had some testimony to provide the committee. Uh, there, yes. are, there are reporters in the room. Um, all but one of the committee members are here, um, and you're, well, you're not being filmed, but the phone is being filmed by a local cable television uh, producer. So um, just so you're aware that it's a very public process. So if you'd like to tell us a little bit about why you're interested in this bill, and as I understand you personally. Um, yes, um, uh, Azim, you and I haven't met or, or spoken. My name is Susan Lawrence. I'm the founder and CEO of the Center for Life Without Parole Studies. I did speak with your daughter, Tasreen, and thank both of you for being willing to testify. If it's okay with you, I'll just tell the committee just a little bit about you, and then you can, you know, expand on that. Um, can you hear Susan? Okay, so you're breaking up a little bit. Can you repeat what you just said, please? Uh, Susan, you're going to have to speak up, or? I want me to sit over here. Well, no. I, why don't you just start with your testimony? Um, that might be the easiest way. Okay, so you want me to go ahead and start? Yes, please. Tell us a little okay, bit. All right. so, yeah, so I, I, I support the idea of abolishing the idea of uh, life uh, without parole. Um, in my own particular case, uh, 25 years ago, uh, my only son was murdered. Uh, by a 14-year-old gang member. My son was a student at San Diego State University and worked as a thief of delivery man. And uh, on Fridays and Saturdays, and he was lured to a bogus address by a youth gang. And in the gang initiation, a 14-year-old shot and killed him. Needless to say, it brought my life to a crash and all he was a good kid. Um, and uh, um, and uh, I went through all the emotions you would anticipate a parent to go through. Uh, I have a daughter, but he was my only son. Uh, and I remember, even though it was 25 years ago, those initial days were very, very difficult. Um, you know, you go through despair, you go through hopelessness. You, uh, uh, you, I remember at one point I was even suicidal. But uh, sometimes in deep trauma, uh, uh, there is a spark of clarity. And what I saw in this, in this particular tragedy is that there were victims at both hands of the gun. Uh, 
we could have had another piece of delivery man. It was a random, very selfless. The shooter was a 14 year old. Um, and I, so I saw him as a victim that the enemy was not the 14 year old uh, who killed myself, rather the societal forces that forced many young men and women to fall through the crack and then choose lives of gangs and crimes and drugs and alcohol and weapons. So somehow I felt, uh, obviously I had compassion for myself, but I somehow felt, felt compassion for the kid that took myself's life. Uh, and seeing that as a, as a country, we were not doing enough to make sure uh, young souls like him fall to the crack and, and become involved in crime at such a young age at 14 they should be playing with toys and not guns. So nine months after I uh, lost my son, I started that organization just named after my son. It's called the Tari Kamisa Foundation. And uh, I learned a lot about the challenges that uh, young men and young women face uh, in, in, in our inner cities. And, and, and the mission of the foundation was to stop kids from killing kids by breaking the cycle of youth violence. And essentially, the three mandates, our first mandate was to save lives of children. We lose so many on a daily basis, and it's important to do. Our second mandate was to empower them the right choices so they don't choose lives of gangs and crimes and drugs and alcohol and methods. And our third mandate was to teach the principles of nonviolence, of empathy and compassion, of uh, accountability, of forgiveness, of peacemaking, and peace building. And I come to the simple premise that violence is a learned behavior. If you accept that uh, as an axiom or as a truism, then nonviolence can also be a learned behavior. And I can feel that as a country, as a society, we were doing enough to teach nonviolence. And fast forward, I forgave my son's killer. I invited his grandfather and guardian uh, to join me in the foundation. And fast forward 25 years later, the foundation, with the grace of God, has created a safe school model. Uh, we are successfully keeping kids away from lives of gangs and drugs and alcohol and, and, and crime. And, and, and we are teaching forgiveness. We are cutting tourism. We're also cutting expulsions and suspensions by over 70%. And our programs are very affordable. We are based in San Diego County. Uh, although uh, a couple of years ago, we started our national expansion. We have a second site in Pennsylvania and are now expanding. And in California, the, the cost of public education, K through 12, is about $11,500. Uh, the cost of incarceration is $148,000 or $400 a day. You don't have to spend in that, the recidivism rate is over, uh, uh, over 84%. The, the foundation has developed a safe school model, which has four distinct programs. And the first one is a live assembly with me and the grandfather. And we are introduced to the students, this man's grandson, kill this man's son. And here they are in the spirit of forgiveness, compassion, and brotherhood. He's African American, my roots are Eastern, he's Christian, I'm Muslim, his kid killed my son, and we are brothers. And we're very, very committed and uh, to make sure the kids don't end up dead like my son or end up in prison like your grandson. We have a, a, a 10 week curriculum that follows assembly. We create a peace club on campus, and then for the kids that are on a slippery slope, potentially going to be involved with gangs and, 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 and crimes, just like the kid who killed my son, we have a mentoring program for them. And the cost of the entire safe school uh, 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 program is $100 a kid a year. But you compare that to what they're spending in incarceration, which is very, very affordable. The kid who killed my son, is now 39. This parole hearing was in November of 2017. I was there with my daughter, who is the executive director of my son's foundation, advocating for his release with the attitude that uh, he's not the enemy. He has a lot of work to do, not, not in prison. He has to be on stage with me and think about the power of him on stage saying that 
And uh, when he was 11, he joined a gang when he was 14. He murdered his, he murdered my son. And he wishes he would turn the clock back. And I know he sincerely wants to turn the clock back. And against our laws, because typically when you go for a parole hearing the first time, you do not wait for all. But the commissioner was very moved by saying that, you know, I never had a, a victim's father and sister advocate for an offender's uh, 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 release. And he actually won parole. And then he left. Uh, he was finally released in April because he went after he went parole. The governor has to sign off. And then he was has to be in a halfway house. And just last October, he left the halfway house and is now with his uh, grandfather and already participating in the foundation programs. So, so you know, the, the, the testimony that I wanted to, to make here is to say that there are a lot of resources, especially young people that go to prison that early, that can come out and become expert witnesses. Uh, what I can't bring my son back from the dead, and uh, uh, I know that I can hopefully save other parents to go through the same anguish, and I look, his name is Tony, I look at Tony, that him now participating with our foundation programs, and he's going to make sure that not many others follow his formal footsteps. So that was my testimony. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. I, uh, your, your stories um, and, and your courage, really, in starting a foundation after the tragic loss of your son is, um, is inspiring to hear. And, uh, I wish we could have met you in person, uh, but I really appreciate that. Um, Vermont, uh, a couple of years ago, passed a law that you could not do life without parole for anybody under the age of 18. Uh, right. And uh, if California had that law, obviously, uh, I don't know what the status is of, of it has passed. Yeah, they do have yeah. that. Um, in California, the law was 16 and under, and they reduced it to 14 and under in, in January 1st, 1995. And this tragedy happened exactly three weeks later. Uh, this year, they have gone back to 16. So. Um, it, 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 if it was 16, it would have been out a long time, yeah. Well, thank you. I don't know if there any other committee members have questions. No, but I was really inspired by your story. Thank you. Unfortunately, Senator Bruce is not here. He's, he's ill with the flu, so has nothing to do with the roads. So I'm sorry that he missed your testimony, but uh, he can catch up. Okay, well, I wish you well, and I am, I think Vermont is uh, definitely uh, more enlightened than we are in California, and I appreciate you moving forward uh, in trying to uh, uh, get rid of this life, uh, 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 you know, without parole. I, I, I think, uh, uh, and I actually, I, I didn't say this in my testimony, but I do work in, uh, in three of our federal prisons in Leavenworth, in Milan, and in Petersburg, um, and have inspired those priorities to come back out and help young people not follow in their footsteps. So I truly believe that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that there is a lot of resources in prisons, and, and, and when they do come out, uh, uh, they can be contributing members of society. And I've written a lot about this for the justice. I've authored five books. And, and I feel that part of our, our commitment as a society is to make sure that the big, of course, you have to heal the victims, but you can't bring my son back. But working with the grandfather and now also working with the kid that killed my son is meaningful to me and my family. There's less kids are ending up dead or ending up in prison. But the second thing I think is important to do is to make sure that the offender is brought back into society as a functioning, contributing member. And we've done that with Tony. And the third thing is to heal the community because crime happens in the context of community and by the foundation working in our schools. And not only in our schools, and also working in, in the same communities 
we are also healing our community. So it's a lot more humane and a lot more better way to justice than having this punitive mindset. So I think that Vermont definitely is moving in the right direction. And I want to thank you all for the opportunity for me to speak with you and also to move forward with this effort. Thank you, and, and thank, thank you for getting up really early out in California. It's, <laughs> yes. it's 9.30 and here, and I, I know it's 6.30 mm -hmm. out there, so, so thank you for being available at an early hour. You're very welcome. All the best. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, last but not least, do you want to introduce yeah, so so like I was saying, my, my, the two witnesses that I wanted, I'm so grateful that you are allowing to speak. Um, they come from a completely different perspective. So you've heard Azim, very powerful story. Um, Nick Woodall is a former Life Without Parole prisoner um, who um, actually contacted me after he got his commutation from Governor Brown and um, after he was found suitable for parole. He um, is a paralegal. He got a paralegal uh, license while he was in prison. And he's been out about 90 days now. He works at a law firm in Los Angeles. And he works with me to do advocacy work in California on life without parole sentences and other forms of criminal justice reform. He's an extraordinary man, a man of great integrity, um, who has turned his life around. He was in prison for 32 years. And he'll tell you his story. He's he's uh, he's an example of why we shouldn't just warehouse people. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is Senator Dick Sears and the Senate Judiciary Committee in Vermont. Thank you for Nick, uh, is this Nick Woodall? This is Nick Woodall, good morning. Good morning, and um, uh, thank you for taking time with us, especially at this early hour out in California. Um, Absolutely, my pleasure. Well, uh, Susan Lawrence is here and uh, has introduced uh, your case to us, and I believe you've worked with Susan. Um, That's correct. And so, uh, please, uh, any testimony that you have, I want to let you know that there are reporters in the room, there are other witnesses in the room, and you're also, you're on the phone so they can't see you, nor can we, but um, there is a uh, camera and a filming by a local cable uh, access um, corporation or company. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please go ahead. Well, good morning. I'd like to thank the Senate committee that's hearing, uh, com conducting hearings right now on Senate Bill 261. Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, Peggy Delaney for coordinating this. And certainly, last but not least, I really want to thank Susan Lawrence for inviting me and, and getting me involved in this. And uh, this is a fight that, that she's been involved with for a long time. And it's my pleasure to work alongside her. And uh, I appreciate the invitation, and I look forward to uh, uh, telling you a few things about my life as well right now. Um, I'm here and I'm speaking today because I want to explain to those who may not know that rehabilitation is important, redemption is important, and it occurs in prison oftentimes with people who never have the opportunity to demonstrate that, but we never know because many times People have sentences like life without parole in many states, especially California, and I understand Vermont as well, where they never are reviewed to determine whether any changes have occurred since the criminal offense. And uh, I can explain to you and testify this morning that in my particular case, um, I committed a heinous crime. I killed a man, Michael Edward Lloyd, who was 20 years old, and I was 20 years old. And in a drug-induced binge, I uh, murdered him, and I regretted that for many years, and still do. But at the age of 28 years old, and eight and a half years on my life without parole sentence, uh, something changed, and I began to think differently. And I didn't even know where this came from, and I didn't like what it was about myself 
that allowed me to think that it was acceptable to murder somebody. And so I saw it change. I didn't know where to find that, but I saw it change, despite it not being readily available to me inside. Uh, ultimately, a few months later, I ended up accepting Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, and it changed my life. And since 1995, I've been on a road to rehabilitation because God, God has changed my life and, and created in me a new person, uh, nothing like the old. And despite not having opportunity to be reviewed or, or go to parole board or, or really essentially never having an opportunity to really have hope to get out of prison, uh, I continue to grow and mature and, and rehabilitate. And I'm here to testify that I'm not the only one. I was in prison for 31 years on that life without parole sentence up until Governor Jerry Brown extended mercy to me by virtue of executive clemency and commuted my sentence of life without parole to a 31 years to life sentence. And at that time I had 31 years in, so I was immediately eligible for parole. And I went to the parole board and I would already had 24 plus years of disciplinary treat behavior rehabilitation, uh, maturity, growing remorse that had just been permeating every part of my being for the better part of 25 years. And fortunately for me, it was evident and, and I was able to express as much and speak to the parole board uh, panel until they determined that I was no longer a threat to society and found me suitable for release. But that would have never occurred absent the graciousness and mercy of Governor Jerry Brown in commuting the life without parole sentence. Absent that, I would have remained in prison. So I, re I was released only 86 days ago. It feels like a year, I can tell you. But it, it, immediately upon release, I continued my life out here with the same philosophies, the same morals and values that God had instilled in me for the last 25 years in prison as a born-again Christian to where I immediately went out and worked. I want to abide by laws. I want to uh, be a, a, a community activist. I want to be involved in helping people. I, I was like that for the last 25 years inside, and it's, this is just a, a further extension of that. And so I immediately uh, was employed working in construction for about a month and a half, but I'm a certified paralegal by trade uh, that I earned inside. And so I immediately got employment uh, the first of this year working at a law firm, and I'm working at a personal injury law firm with the law offices of Victor Alexandrov in Encino, California. They took a chance on me, uh, having been in prison for 32 years, and gave me an opportunity to, to come in there and, and show my worth. And fortunately for me, I had that opportunity, and they accepted me, and it's just doing great. But it just further demonstrates that I wasn't surprised about any of this. Other people may have been. But this is, this is my life, it has been for many years. But without an opportunity for review of a life without parole prisoner in, in California and in many other states, we never get an opportunity to see that. And as a society, it's important to remember that we're, we're a nation of, of second chances and we believe in, in giving second chances and, and under trying to understand why people commit crimes. And I think that's important to do so. But if we just lock the door and throw away the key, we never give that opportunity for the hope, number one, or for an opportunity for somebody to uh, be a productive member of society ever again, or being able to give back in their own community, whether it's in prison or out. And so I think it's detrimental to the prison population and society as a whole when we do so. Uh, I'm here as a, as a, a relative success story and, and I'm happy to come and testify about that. And, and I think that it's, it's important for me to emphasize the fact that I can tell you I am not the only one. There's many others that are inside that are the same way. I'm not the only one. But if we don't ever take an opportunity to see what's going on in the lives of these men and women across the nation who otherwise would never get an opportunity to even be reviewed, many times laws and regulations in the respective Department of Corrections prevent and preclude uh, any type of review to determine such. But the staff who work with those inmates in there, they know. I was fortunate. There was many staff who knew this about me. 
And while I was in prison for many years, uh, after I became a born again Christian, a lot of staff recommended to the governor that I have my sins commuted. 96 staff put their signature down on the line. But you know who didn't know? A parole board. You know who didn't know? The warden, the governor, people in a position to make decisions on that inmate's future uh, parole suitability, etc. But the staff who work with them, they know. I'm not an advocate to let life without parole out of prison. Let me be perfectly frank. I'm, I'm an advocate for give somebody an opportunity to be reviewed. We've committed uh, life without parole inmates. Obviously, you're getting that, that uh, increased sentence because you've committed a crime that society has determined is that much more egregious. But you know what? We know that as human beings, there's always room for redemption. There's always room for rehabilitation. But if we never take the time to look and search for it, we may miss it. And as a result, we suffer as a society. So I appreciate your time. And thank you for that this morning. If thank there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, Nick, um, I have one. Well, thank you for your testimony. Very helpful. And um, your life story is uh, uh, certainly, I'm, I'm curious um, how it eventually got to uh, the governor's office. You, you said you had 96 staff, but it wasn't the warden, it wasn't the people who could right. make the decision. How did? How, why did your case get to the governor's desk and not 20 others? I just, I just happened to be, um, the opportunity came and I just happened to, my actual clemency application sat dormant for 14 years until Governor Brown began looking at him. But that didn't change the fact that I was a changed person. No. I didn't change to get commuted. I had already lived that life, and so by the time the governor's office, you know, it's very political, but by the time the governor's office determined they wanted to review some clemency applications, mine had been sitting there for 14 years, and as a result, I was still the same person. I was still prepared, and so I was ready when the time came for review. And many people would have given up after 14 years, I'm sure. So. I agree. I agree. Um, were there... Uh, the victim in your crime, um, uh, did did he have any family who spoke either for or against you? He, he did not. Uh, none of his family spoke for or against me. Just the district attorney from the county I was uh, convicted from attended the uh, parole board hearing and, and spoke on their behalf. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's uh, helpful. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Woodall? No, thank you. Nick, thanks again for taking time with us, and particularly at this hour. We recognize uh, it's here in California, and uh, it's very early there, but you probably yeah. don't have snow. <laughs> That's easy. It's easy to do. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'm up early on my way to work right now, okay. and I appreciate you uh, entertaining me and letting me have this time to speak with you and just speak on this very important matter. And I appreciate the consideration that you're giving to this bill, uh, as well as all the people that are speaking in support of it right now. And, and I'm just excited to see that, that people are even taking an opportunity to, to look at some of these laws that we need to pay attention to, that they have long-term effect on our communities and our societies as a whole. And so I appreciate your time as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Um, thank you, Susan, for having both of those folks here. And I still haven't heard from Skylar's, but that, that's okay. Uh, Bryn, do you know if in Vermont, could, could the governor commute a sentence? Can the governor commute a sentence? Yeah. Yes. He could? Yes. Yeah. How does he go about it? That, I'd have to. I wonder if he's ever, uh, any governor's ever commuted sentences. I can look into that and get back who, to the committee uh, about For a person who hasn't passed away, I think there was. I think that there's a difference, at least in California, there's a difference between a pardon and a commutation. In California, a commutation is someone who's still serving time. Yeah. Uh, a pardon is some, it could be somebody who's Right, who's now, I know there have been a lot of pardons in Vermont. I don't know about any commute. Yeah. yeah, what that is, I can't pronounce it. 
Um, and I wondered if the governor in Vermont could say, okay, you've been in prison for 31 years, and we're now going to change your sentence to 31 to life. Yeah, I don't, I actually and don't. Which would then allow the parole board to consider parole. So if somebody, you know, is, is one of those 15 um, who's, you know, whatever, for whatever reason, um, was in a similar situation. That's what I'm curious about, if they have that ability. Yeah, I think that, you, I know that they have the right to pardon, but um, I'm not sure if they yeah. do have an explicit statutory right to just come. That's what I was wondering, mm -hmm. if they could do something to what, similar to what Governor Brown did. In California. You know, in, in California, commutations, I don't, I don't know how to say this, it, it's like a crapshoot. It's, it's, it's well, no, not- It appears a, that the case was sitting for 14 days, uh, 14 years on yeah, the governor's desk. Yeah, that and, and <clears throat> even, uh, it, it's a political decision. You know, the governor makes the decision sometimes based on political factors, not necessarily on merit. So it's not the same as um, having a law that right. says you can't well, sentence. Well, you know, we've seen yeah. the cases in Kentucky, which are fascinating. The governor, I can't think of his name. Oh, yes, yes. Um, commuted a whole bunch of sentences, even some that were still in the process of being yes. uh, dealt with. And I don't know. What, you know what his motivation was, but it was like you know, you threw me out, so now I'm gonna show you. And uh, that was, in, I mean, that's one where he just. So, so you do hear of them happening when someone is going out of office. Yeah, yeah. well, those are usually part. The question is, could could they change? Can the governor change a sentence that the judiciary has set down? So in other, you know, if, if we're not, if we're saying that those people who are uh, currently serving life without parole are not part of this bill, could the governor at some point, if he or she chose, change that sentence for those people? That's the question, really. Assume this bill passed, and it passed in, in either the allowing aggravated murder or not allowing aggravated murder to be life without parole. But you're still not retroactive. And when you say you're not retroactive, how would that work? I mean, well, you've got I know for the old people already sounds in there, but how about someone who commits the crime before the effective date of this bill? Would they come under this? Well, without to ask Bern. I think it's a policy choice for the committee, but I don't know. Usually, if the crime was committed, the sentencing occurs on the effective date of the bill, the bill's effective, I guess. Right, so the, the just I would guess up, that it would be any current, what, go ahead. Just to follow up on that, the board, um, the parole board acts as an advisory board for the governor on rec and recommends, um, they can assist him or her to make recommendations about who should be eligible for a pardon. A pardon, but yeah. not for a commutation. Right. So in other words, what Governor Brown did in this case, which is something we might consider in this bill, but, you know, the governor was able to change the sentence. Right. Now, I don't know how the judiciary would feel about that, but. <clears throat> Could the governor make it more? Well, I, I mean, let's say that somebody, you know, take back the, the whole issues during the Cashman debacle. For, it was a sexual assault case, and mm -hmm. there was wide criticism to, for a judge who had given a relatively minor sentence for a sexual assault. And people were up in arms about it, and Fox News came into Vermont, and Bill O'Reilly's <coughs> program, spent a lot of time on it. The question is, if we give the governor the power to commute a sentence, could the governor, in reverse, go and say, well, wait a minute, that sentence, I don't think so, no, under the Constitution. So. But we'll have to make sure if we do something like that. Now, you can't change the sentence. Well, I'm going to give it 10 years, because politically that would be better. 
Thank you. Thanks for coming all the way from California on a snowy day. Oh, you're so welcome. You, this demonstrates how important this issue is to me. You know, I, I really would not miss being here, and I'll come as frequently yeah. as I can. No, not, not right now. Well, and also tonight. If you didn't have the authority to not increase the money. Right. I don't think constitutionally. But the, the question is, should we give that power to the governor? Give the power to increase the sentence? No. No. Well, to commute a sentence if the governor, like this Woodhall case in California, who could then change the sentence to, thir you know, 31 years to life, uh, to life, and then make him eligible for parole. That's how we. That's how we got to the parole. So we do or don't have that. Ability. We don't have that. We ability. don't have. You can't. He can, the parole board could recommend to the governor that he give the individual a full pardon, mm -hmm. but politically, I'm not sure that the governor would want to give a full pardon to a murderer yeah. unless there was something extenuating. I don't know if it's. Or even a recommendation from the parole board, depending on the, unless there was something. Yeah. Yeah. Under yeah. current law, the parole board could recommend. Yes, absolutely. You could recommend what? A pardon. A pardon. A pardon. But they could recommend a, a lesser sentence. So in Vermont, is a commutation different than a pardon? Uh, there's California, no, there's, there's, no, there's no ability for a commutation. There's only ability to pardon. A pardon, OK. As I understand That's right. the research. I haven't heard about any pardons recently here. I think mean, Shovelin did some pardons. Shovelin did a lot of marijuana pardons. pardons. Yeah. Is that what they were called? Pardons? Huh? They were called pardons? Pardons, yeah. Yeah. At that point. Is there another type of term for holding a pardon? Not that I am aware of. What do you mean term? Like, well, I mean, if someone has, like, the record seat, well, we have sealing of We have expungement. We have expungement, right. yeah. But that requires a certain amount of time post any parole or probation in every period. <coughs> so, uh, all right. Well, um, fortunately, unfortunately, I've not heard from Skyler. I hope he's OK. Yeah, I emailed him. I haven't heard either. Uh, so, but I will try to reach him. And we will schedule some time next week to go over this bill and try to make some decisions. Uh, uh, anyone else has any comments for to happen in the next four minutes. Thank you. Or one might look at improve, depending upon your point of view. <laughs> We're on the record. Um, however, um, sometimes we do report because we don't know what to do. This report is very serious to me um, on the forensic because it says a lot about how the system moves forward in the future. And so I, I really take that part of the bill very seriously. Um, and uh, I hope everyone else does. But uh, what happened is, as I've talked to Eric and Katie and met with them last week, it became obvious to me that the system wasn't ready for a hold of up to three years on persons who were um, forensic and that it would really disrupt what is already a chaotic system into even more chaos. So I, we have the drafts in front of you. Uh, so we uh, Yeah, well, I'm just going to go ahead without them. So you have the drafts in front of you, and I'm not sure what I need. Yeah, we have draft two point, is it 3.1? 3.1. 3.1, three point um, which um, Katie and uh, Eric will go over. But uh, Eric was going to do a side by side of what's missing. And when I looked at the side by side, it said, oh my god, that's, you know, it really has changed dramatically. <laughs> so maybe we should work as this is a new bill. Go ahead with each of your parts, and okay. hopefully Senator White and Nick will get back here. Right. 
Well, thanks, Senator Sears. Uh, Eric Dispatch for the Office of Legislative Council. Katie McLenn, Office of Legislative Council. Morning again on uh, S-183. As you mentioned, Senator Sears, there's substantial differences between this draft and the previous one, so as you suggest, it's probably better just to look at this draft as a fresh start. There were a number of provisions in the previous one that, as you said, system systemically probably wasn't really ready for that. Um, but before we get to the, the uh, forensic bed, secure residential recovery facility issue that you mentioned in the studies later on, there are still a significant provision in the beginning regard, regarding the procedure uh, when someone is found uh, not guilty by reason of insanity or incompetent to stand trial. Or in this case, it focuses on the, the not guilty by reason of insanity group. So it might help just for a moment to sort of review the, the section one existing law, which you see right there on page one and two is all existing law. No changes proposed to that. So the, the, to think of the chronology of where this statute appears in the, in the sort of timeline of a criminal proceeding, you see the very first line uh, in the bill, in the existing section on line nine, it starts with, if the court finds the person, that the person is a person in need of treatment or a patient in need of further treatment. So that's assuming, you don't have it in front of you, but what has happened up to that point is that a person has been found either not guilty by reason of insanity or incompetent to stand trial for a criminal offense. That's what's happened before the language you see here in the bill. But once that does happen, then the court has to make a determination. What happens to that person? They're either gonna be committed to the Department of Mental Health or not. And in order for them, uh, the person to be committed, that's where lines nine and 10 come in. There has to be, has to be a finding uh, by the court that the person is in need of treatment and that means a danger of harm to themselves or others. So if they're dangerous to themselves or others, then they can, uh, will be committed to DMH custody. That's the existing procedure. Does that make sense? Uh, no, because I lose my whole career. <laughs> well, judicial retention is an emergency and so I've only been sent to the adult sick again. Judge Grisham wants to send the bank, and I'd have to pause in the middle of a bill. It's the first time I've said no to a judge, by the way. I think we should be dealing with judicial retention. To, to remind you, I have to be next door at 11 20 for testimony. Yeah, well, that will end that. Is it an emergency? No, we're trying to sort out of judicial retention, which is tonight. Well, can you be done by 11.20 so Senator Benning can go? Because I can't. Uh, we only have three Yeah, I'll be back before that. Okay, thank you. Want. All right. So that's... Oh, because of the snow. Yeah. yeah. Oh. It's a bunch of whips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I traveled longer to get here, and everybody's trying to get out. I know. I know. You travel all the way from... We're in West or Lindenville, or East Lindenville, or wherever. All right, Aaron. Sure. Okay. <laughs> start over, not start completely over, but back to where you were before right, that right. interruption. <laughs> so yes, the, the, what you're looking at, Barney, was what this decision the court has to make uh, once a person has been found not guilty by reason of insanity or incompetent to stand trial. Now, so if you look at that existing law, uh, go down to. Um, uh, line 13 through 16 now this is also an interesting point in any case involving personal injury or threat of personal injury committing court may issue an order requiring a hearing before discharge now that's just interesting because you'll see this come up uh, during the proposed new language that katie and i are presenting that there's a difference in treatment there between uh persons are have convicted been convicted of one offense or another right you already have in law the fact that in this case, it has to do with the, uh, whether the court might order a hearing, but it depends on whether the case involved personal injury or threat of personal injury, not necessarily a requirement in terms of a hearing if it wasn't one of those kind of cases. So these cases are being treated differently based on the what you might call the seriousness of the offense. So that's already in there. You also, if you turn over to the next page now, this is also existing law, uh, subsection C, page two, uh, you see, this talks about the procedures uh, when someone who has been committed to the custody of DMH is then uh, potentially being discharged. Now what happens in one of those situations, you'll see line four, at least 10 days prior to discharge, uh, the Commissioner of Mental Health has to give notice of the discharge to, and this is line six now, the committing court, the court that made the commitment, 
the state's attorney of the county where the prosecution originated. It goes on to talk about some more procedures uh, related to discharge, but the point here is that notice is already being uh, provided to the state's attorney in a certain subcategory of cases. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Same thing, bottom of that subsection, lines 18 to 20. Prior to the hearing, oh, sorry, uh, lines 16 to 20. Again, notice of the hearing shall be given to the commissioner, state's attorney of the county where the prosecution originated, the committed person, person's attorney, and prior to the hearings, the state's attorney may enter an appearance. So you already have some procedures for state's attorneys to get notice in certain cases, certain discharges. So that's kind of the background of what is existing law. And then you move on to page three and what's the proposal? The proposal involves victim notice. That's the what's on the uh, page in front of you. So you've already got this situation where uh, the state's attorneys are getting notice uh, in discharge situations. This says, uh, it says the lines one through four now, this new provision regarding victim notice applies when a person has been found not guilty by reason of insanity, that's line three, for an offense listed in 33 VSA 5204A. That's the big 12. So those are the big 12 offenses that you already have uh, in juvenile law. And there's, again, there's, there's been different um, Mm -hmm. attempts over the years to sort of define, well, what is marks a serious felony? But this is one of the ones that the legislature often relies on well, when it wants to sort of make a marking spot between serious crimes. It uses the big 12 for that purpose, and that's what that is. So when the offense has been a big 12 offense and the person's been found not guilty by reason of insanity, that's when this victim notification requirement kicks in. So what, ha what is the requirement exactly that starts on line five? similar to the language you just saw, at least 10 days prior to discharge, right? That part's similar. But it goes on, it's a little broader here. At least 10 days prior to discharging the person from a secure mental health treatment facility, and I'm sort of skipping the struck through language. I should have mentioned there that uh, uh, yesterday, Katie and I met with uh, Morning Fox and Karen Barber from the Department of Mental Health, and we were sort of going at this language, trying to uh, cover what it is I think you guys were trying to cover, which is, uh, from what we had heard about last fall and uh, corrections over justice oversight and um, from some of the witness testimony that there was some concern that limiting it to the word discharge meant that uh, it, it only applied when someone was formally discharged from the hospital. Now that may or may not be the case in practice but I think that was the concern that some people expressed. So in order to be make sure that wasn't the case that, that and notice would be provided not only when there was a formal discharge but also when uh, someone uh, was their care level was being stepped down or they might be being discharged not just from a hospital but, but from Middlesex, a secure residential facility, or even from um, uh, community care. That's the right way to phrase that. But, uh, um, so we want to sweep those situations in and that's what that language is an attempt to do. That, that covers the non-hospitalization order? It does. Yeah. So the way it reads now, discharging the person from a secure mental health treatment facility. So that's meant to include either a hospital setting or a secure residential. And then it goes on to say, or from the care and custody. So that includes the ONH piece. Yeah. So in any one of those situations, at least 10 days before uh, that proposed action happens, uh, the um, Commissioner of Mental Health provides notice of the proposed action, this is lines 9 and 10 now, to the state's attorney of the county where the prosecution originated. Now remember, some of that is a little overlap between what we just saw mm -hmm. in the discharge uh, in the previous subsection, but it's a similar idea to provide notice to the state's attorney as they do in those other cases. In this case though, uh, lines 11 and 12, the state's attorney then provides notice of the proposed action any victim of the offense who has requested that notice be provided. So the victim makes a request for to be notified when these things happen, then, then they'll be provided with that notice by the state's attorney. Mm -hmm. Shall we turn to it, um, addressing the HIPAA issue here? Yes, I think um, that has okay. to be mentioned for sure. So there, were, there was conversation about HIPAA and notice last time we met. Um, and I think there's common agreement that the Department of Mental Health is a covered entity and that um, information about when a person is no longer receiving treatment is protected health information. So I think there's no question that HIPAA is implicated, um, but Eric and I have done some a bit of research <laughs> and what we have a copy of um, our exceptions to, to HIPAA. Oh, These are the federal okay. regulations. So we're gonna show you that um, specific language. And we're looking at subsection A. 
And this is an exception standard um, for uses and disclosures required by law. So it says that a covered entity may use or disclose protected health information to the extent that such use or disclosure is required by law and the use or disclosure complies with and is limited to the relevant requirements of such law. Mm -hmm. um, Here's the definition of required by law, which oh, is the obvious first question that would leap to mind, I think. Okay, so required by law means a mandate contained in law that compels an entity to make a use or disclosure of protected health information and that is enforceable in a court of law. Required by law includes but is not limited to court orders and court ordered warrants, subpoenas, or summons issued by a court, grand jury, government, or tribal inspector general or an administrative body authorized to require the production of information, a civil or an authorized investigative demand Medicare conditions of participation with respect to health care providers participating in the program, and statutes or regulations that require the production of information, including statutes or regulations that require such information if payment is sought under a government program providing public benefits. So from here, Eric and I looked at some case law to try to determine if there was any guidance on how to use this particular exception. And what we found is um, there's nothing binding in Vermont or the Second Circuit. So we were really relying on case law from other states to sort through this. Um, and there's um, certainly some variation um, across the country, but it seems that there um, are enough cases that would allow um, Vermont to see this type of notice as an acceptable use of the exception to be able to kind of hang our hat on that and make uh, an argument on that basis. And of course, um, there's no way to be certain how our co courts would interpret that until it was challenged. Um, but there's certainly language in case law that says um, if disclosure is mandated by state law, then the exception 16412A permits the disclosure um, even when the situation is not serious and imminent. Um, additionally, there's case law that says subparagraph one that we're looking at is an exception that stands on its own, allowing a covered entity to make a disclosure otherwise prohibited by HIPAA if that disclosure is required by another law. In disclosing the information, the covered entity must simply comply with the requirements of the law. HIPAA imposes no further conditions. Um, but the way you have this written, all that is being released is a notice of a proposed discharge. Mm -hmm. You're not releasing information about when they successfully completed the programming, what the programming was, mm -hmm. whether or not there's still a danger to society or X, Y, and Z. The only thing that the state's attorney is getting is going to be notice of a proposed discharge, mm -hmm. and that in turn is sent to the victim in a particular case. Mm -hmm. So said another way, whether the person is still receiving some type of treatment or, or care under the custody of the commissioner. Okay. And I just follow up on Katie's point there, a couple of sort of quotes from cases that kind of reaffirm the point. I think was that uh, this is from a Western District of New York federal case last uh, two years ago, 2018, the court said, disclosure that is permitted uh, under the required by law exception. That's what that's known as, the required by law exception. It's where disclosure is mandatory, not merely permissible. So that's a key point. If you if the language said may disclose, it wouldn't qualify. It has to be required by law. And um, the reason for that is that HIPAA, and this is a great quote I thought, HIPAA defers to the judgment of state and federal legislators who drafted the law requiring disclosure. disclosure. I also like to hear the drafting of the law mentioned specifically. <laughs> but it's deferring to your policy judgment. When, when you make a policy judgment, and they talk about that specifically, that something is important enough, some information is important enough, to require disclosure, they defer to that judgment. For goodness sakes, I've never heard of the federal government deferring to the judgment of state <laughs> <laughs> So that, oh. Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, that's the notice piece. And if you'd like, I can keep moving through to the next section. Yeah, please. Okay. Section two hasn't changed since the committee last saw this bill, uh, but just to refresh your memory, this is a reporting requirement. By November of this year, the Departments of Correction and Mental Health are jointly submit an inventory and evaluation of mental health services that are provided by the entity that DOC contracts with 
for healthcare services. So that, in particular, has stayed exactly the same since the last version. And then section three on page four, line 10, um, this is the forensic care working group. There were elements of this in the last version that you looked at, but the language has changed. Um, so our lead in language just tells us that by August 1st of this year, the DMH is to convene a working group. And there's language on line 12 that says, including as appropriate, and lists various stakeholders to be consulted. The language as appropriate is added because um, there's a new instruction to look at um, options for forensic facility, um, and that analysis might take um, the expertise of different people who are maybe looking at the system overall in t terms of policy and the mental health and criminal justice systems. For example, BGS probably wouldn't be weighing in on subdivision one about the policy, um, whereas they would be weighing in in subdivision two about a facility. So the folks specifically who would be uh, stakeholders um, as part of this work group would be the Department of Corrections, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, the Office of the Attorney General, the Office of the Defender General, the Director of Healthcare Reform. This is um, specifically to weigh in on the IMD issue and to provide expertise there, and uh, the Department of Buildings and General Services. So Subdivision 1 is, um, I guess, similar in concept to what you've seen before. This requires the work group to identify gaps in current mental health and criminal justice system structure and opportunities to improve public safety and coordination of treatment for individuals who are not competent to stand trial or who are adjudicated not guilty by reason of insanity. It goes on to say that the group is to review competency restoration models that are used in other states and models that are used to balance um, both mental health treatment and public safety. And the example given there is um, psychiatric security review boards. We know that there are three states that currently have those types of boards. So that is subdivision one. And then in subdivision two, we move to kind of the physical facility question. So this asks for an evaluation of um, models for a state-funded forensic treatment facility for individuals that are not competent or who are adjudicated not guilty by a reason of insanity. And then we have a list of exactly what the evaluation shall address. So in subdivision A, whether there's a need for a forensic treatment facility in Vermont, in B, the entity or entities most appropriate to operate a forensic treatment facility in Vermont, in subdivision C, the feasibility and appropriateness of repurposing an existing facility for the purpose of establishing a forensic treatment facility, such as Woodside, versus constructing a new facility for this purpose. In subdivision D, the number of beds needed in a forensic treatment facility and the impact. Before you go further there, I'm mm -hmm. pointing out that I'm talking with Senator Benning about the availability of funds in the capital bill. Pretty simple to understand that probably constructing a new facility is not going to be simple. Given the need for a new, you know, it's clear there's a new a need for a new women's facility for corrections. It's clear there's needs for facilities for other psychiatric patients. So I just want to be realistic. Hey, did you send that information? So that um, we're on subdivision D, line 15. The evaluation is also to look at the number of beds needed in a forensic treatment facility and the impact that repurposing an existing mental health treatment facility would have on the availability of beds for persons who are seeking mental health treatment um, through the community or through civil commitment. And lastly, in subdivision E, the fiscal impact of constructing or repurposing a forensic treatment facility, an estimated annual operational cost, um, considering the institutes, institutions of mental disease, the IMD waiver, waivers available um, through CMS don't provide um, for federal fiscal participation for forensic um, mental health patients. So those are the two pieces that this evaluation and work group um, will be We'll be putting together and then the report itself is due on November 1st of this year um, the Department of Mental Health is to um, submit the report with findings and recommendations to joint legislative justice oversight and specifically the report is to include proposed draft legislation adapting K 
Connecticut Psychiatric Security Review Board to reflect Vermont's mental health and criminal justice systems. Can I ask a question? Why, on the forensics working group, um, because they're going to be addressing gaps in the system and many other issues, we only have state departments in here. We haven't asked them to consult with any of the community partners yeah. at all. You want to check I mean, wouldn't that make sense? Um, on line 12, it says including. So uh, that's including but not limited to, and you, there's certainly nothing that would stop you from specifically naming those groups. I just, um, I think there are a lot of um, people outside of the, our own bureaucracy that have a lot of um, insight into this, and I would hate to, I mean, I'm assuming that the Department of Mental Health would include them, but I would want to make sure that it's clear that they have to speak to the community partners and the, um, all those people outside of our own bureaucracy. I don't know how to write that, but. We've put in other legislation and other interested stakeholders. Um, we could pull in um, the DAs and the SSAs. Um, I mean, it, and it might be, it, it, I, I don't know who they all are, but I think that we need to get it outside of our bureaucracy. Okay. Um, any other, is, is that? That's a recommendation that I'm making. Yeah. We <laughs> make, make it clear that they have to work with, with um, the community groups well, and partners. There's also, also another effort here that I'm interested in and may be attached to this bill. It's called the Stepping Up Initiative, and I gave you information on that during bits from the Justice Center. And uh, it attempts to get people who are mentally ill out of the correction system before they get in, mm -hmm. and so that they are um, the court before they um, set bail or put somebody in who's significant out of serious mental illness would be dealt with in a different way. Um, there's a number of, just, I think the estimates are about 50 people who are in detention with significant mental health issues who are currently residing in our prisons probably should be dealt with in a different place. So, um, Bryn will have some information on that. I've got a uh, conversation with people from the Justice Center sometime the next week. So we we'll probably hold this bill until after I get to see some of that language. But it's a, if you want to go on the website of the Council of State Government's Justice Center, you can find the Stepping Up Initiative. It's basically designed for counties because the counties in most states are in charge of a county jail and it attempts to keep people who are mentally ill out of the county jail. Um, but because we're a unified system, it makes it a little more difficult to develop those programs. I do know there's a, there was or is a mental health court in Burlington, Chittenden County maybe it should be available everywhere but um, anyway that, so that's one thing I'd like to consider and Bryn I think is working on that so maybe you we get three members of <laughs> but um, be that as it may we've got other people scheduled to testify but um, again can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. We've got uh, Woodside Dual Rehabilitation Center referred to on page 5, line 13. Is there a reason to have that referenced at all? Other than that, it seemed to me um, that if you were looking for a place that could be rehabilitated uh, a little differently, um, it could be a forensic hospital. I, I, it just popped into my head, we could take that out. I've, the decision could be made about that facility before these guys sit down to create this report. Okay, well, so who makes that decision? Well, I'm trying to figure that out. We've all been <laughs> under that gun. We keep seeing reports coming by, and no general is out there saying, this is the way it's going to be, so we'll do it. What if next week's agenda had an item on Woodside? Oh, in this committee. See the future. 
Huh? I see the future. <laughs> it's really? That's you know, great minds think alike, John. Okay. I don't know if that means that we both have great minds or we're just two. I, I don't want to take any chance that decisions on that facility get held up waiting for a report that some people could interpret. This. Well, I think yeah. we could take that <laughs> out. <laughs> That's <laughs> similar <laughs> to. Oh, no, I well, it's, 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 it's going to be a forensic facility. facility, is what we're looking for. Well, we for. just take out Woodside and leave its existing yeah. facility. Yeah. Okay. Which could yeah. be, you know, I think we still own Windsor, don't we? We do. Right now. <coughs> right now. Right now. Yeah. A lot of empty colleges. <laughs> a lot of empty colleges. <laughs> well, we don't own them. <laughs> no, I know. But they are existing facilities. They are I think for sale facilities. I have to tell you, cheap. Yeah. I will just give you a little sigh. We had the chair of the board of Southern Vermont College, and Senator Campion and I had them in here, and the chair of the Bennington Select Board. And that day it had been announced that the sale of, Bennington, of Southern Vermont College to a prep school from New Hampshire had fallen through because of the whole building. And I said, well, I know we're looking for a woman's prison, and this sounds like an ideal place for it. You've got all that land, and uh, both of them like, oh boy. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it didn't go over as well as I'd hoped. <laughs> so, but. You know, if we're, we're looking at, um, look, it's always bothered me that we have a unified system. and. If we're looking at new facilities and having to do, why don't we do some more low level um, spread around the state in counties? And well, have, maybe not in every it's a county. Long story, but, but I can give you. Well, the I know why it happened. I know but, why it happened. But, but I let just, me tell you what West Virginia did. They went to a uh, unified system a few years ago before the before they became so red that you know, it's hard to figure things out. But they did something very smart. They build back the counties for people who are sentenced, who are on detention, and they build back counties for people who would formerly have been in a county jail. Those are people that had less than a year's sentence. So they build back the counties the cost of of providing. Yeah, that isn't what I was thinking of. I was well, thinking but it, but well, in Vermont though, you don't have the state's attorneys. I see you over there, James. <laughs> um, the state's attorneys, um, it's been said, have no incentive to not send somebody to, um, and the counties have no incentive not to send somebody to jail because it's not on their dime. Now, I, that, I know, but what, what I were you talking about? What I am talking about is that. I worked, for example, I worked with our sheriff around a project that would have created a, a regional kind of facility that was residential secure and it was secure, but it it didn't need to be prison level secure. And and it seems to me that we, if we had some of those in the state as opposed to the prison level secure, that we could. It would be less expensive. It would be better for the people who are either being de detained or uh, incarcerated. And I, I just I don't understand why we don't look a little more creatively instead of just looking at new prisons. Well, we have 14 of those county jails. Yeah, but it, yeah, and their county jails are clearly not. I mean, our county jail is such a pit that. But there are other options, and if you're going to build right. things, you could be building it more regionally and less. Well, that's what anyway. they, they started out it's with Chittenden, Woodstock, St. Johnsbury, and Rutland were regional correctional facilities. They're prisons. Regional correctional facilities. Yeah. That's what they were. Yeah, yeah. well, they're prisons. Okay, whatever. Yeah. That, they are. Yeah. They're not maximum security, though. No, but it, different philosophy. All right, different. our next witness. Anyway, <laughs> I, does any questions for Eric? Or Kate? Sorry, but it's <laughs> always bothered. It's so always bothering me. To find out now. Is, um, Katie, yeah. uh, is James Tucker? Yeah. Speaking of 
County Prosecutors, who represents the County Prosecutors. <coughs> For a one voice on everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. They all agree on everything. They all agree. So, uh, James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, you think this is a good bill? Uh, there, the notice provision that's on page three, I think, is very narrowly tailored, and the state's attorneys would like to see that expanded. Um, you know, we're talking about notice here, not, um, you know, extending custody or, you know, this is a much different bill than how it originally started. Um, um, but one of, the, one of the gaps that I identified when we were talking about the original bill was um, this idea that uh, someone's found incompetent to stand trial. They have these charges still hanging over their head. You know, they've committed, allegedly committed a pretty serious offense. And after this original 90-day order um, of commitment, the state's attorney loses all track of this person. They're not given any notice uh, if they're being released or discharged or, or stepped down to the community. And um, the state you know, has a continuing interest in seeking a prosecution if the person is then found competent. Um, so, uh, but we just don't, we can't even order the evaluation because we don't know that it's the person's being released. Um, and so I think that the idea of um, this first couple lines on page three was that, okay, well the original bill was very narrowly tailored towards people um, who were found not guilty by reason of insanity for a murder or attempted murder. Might as well just keep this uh, somewhat narrow to people found not guilty by reason of insanity for a Big 12 offense. Um, but I think that, um, you know, the gap that is there uh, around competent, I don't see why you wouldn't extend this to people that are being discharged um, uh, who were originally found incompetent to stay in trial so that the state could then seek a competency evaluation for those individuals. Um, so, I'm confused. Yeah, I thought that I, I thought right. this is only for insanity, not for incompetence to stand trial. This is only applies to people um, that were committed to the commissioner of, of mental health after having been found not guilty by reason of okay. insanity. Which, by the way, you know, Matt said he's queried his 300, you know, attorneys, and they this is very rare that someone is found not guilty by reason of insanity. Um, right. So you don't have any problem with the 10-day yeah, well, notice? I don't know. In it fact, I think that also be for incompetence. For, for okay. people being discharged, okay. uh, either for, uh, that were committed originally for... Yeah, Eric would like to comment. Yeah, so in response to that, James, um, I spoke to Matt yesterday and to Judge Grierson as well. Mm -hmm. So I think you're reading the finding by not guilty of reason of insanity more narrowly than it actually applies. And according to Matt and Judge Grierson, even... That does not mean to say that there's only been an adjudication or only after a jury trial or a finding by uh, the judge, that there's always a finding, even when the parties have stipulated to it, that there always has to be a formal finding prior to the commitment of person in DMH. So that's why that's drafted that way. We talked about whether or not that would be, that's not addressing the competency to stand trial point. Right. At that point, I, I remember, I think a little background there as to what James is talking about, is that um, when the bill was originally drafted, remember it had a lot more requirements in there having to do with shifting the burden, and, uh, minimum three-year uh, period that the person was going to be committed, that sort of thing. And the proposal from the state's attorneys at that time was that it only covered homicide and um, attempted homicide cases and only findings of not guilty or reason. So I think what James is saying is now that that's different, they're asking for something different. But that's the, what, what the original request was. That, that is correct. I mean, when there was all those extra burdens that were being placed upon the Department of Mental Health and the criminal division, you know, this, the request was to have it applied very narrowly, but that didn't ever address that original bill. These folks that are being released or discharged from the Department of Mental Health, um, when they're originally committed to them because they were incompetent to stand trial. And if we had notice, if the state had notice, we would likely just seek a follow-up competency evaluation to see, okay, well, if they're competent now, they can stay in trial. 
and it does, you know, if they were insane at the time, then they still have that access to the insanity defense. But if they are now competent to stay in trial and participate in their defense, then um, there's no reason why the state shouldn't know that. So if I'm hearing you right, you're proposing on line three, page three, just to, after having found that could be by reason of insanity or incompetent to stand trial, right? Right, so, something along those lines. Yeah. Was there a, was there anything else? Well, the Office of the Attorney General um, in our can office. I just, can I just ask a question there, because I'm rolling around in my head where you're going. If you are found not competent to stand trial, is it all the time that such a finding is made that they are then committed to the image? There would be a commitment hearing uh, to see if there's a, if they were a person in need of treatment. Right. If they're determined to be a person not in treatment, though, do you then lose what you're seeking? So they're not competent to stand trial, right. and which is the legal standard. But then they're also not a person in need of treatment because of the Department of Mental Health standard. I mean, yes, I mean. Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was cutting something. No. Yes, I think we lose that uh, even narrower section of people, but this covers the people that are committed, at least so we have some continuing. I mean. Okay. Well, if they're not committed to the commissioner of mental health no, and there's no discharge, discharge right. there's nothing to. Yeah. Right, right. So, All right. Okay. Yeah. So are we okay with and, and then the state's attorney's suggestion? Yes. Unless I, somebody has some objection to it, I don't. Anybody is objecting? Hearing none. And then, well, again, this now is, we're going to get a section. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we're just. This is something that uh, the Office of the Attorney General and I have been speaking about for a little bit of time now, since the last time this bill came up, about um, having the court be able to uh, require a competency evaluation. This is a separate issue of um, from a state from a state's attorney's hired uh, evaluator. Um, so, um, why would? You well, the way that the statute is written, the way the Supreme Court is interpreted under the plain language of the statute, uh, the state actually doesn't get uh, a crack at evaluating an individual. This, case, this court can order Department of Mental Health to appoint um, an evaluator. The defense can hire an, an evaluation, um, but the, the state's attorney doesn't get one. So the court orders an evaluation. Dr. Wecker is brought in right. to do uh, an interview. They're not the defense counsel or the state mm -hmm. witness at that point, they're just supposedly doing a neutral evaluation. Right. Right. Defense always has the right to hire somebody else if they dislike that. Right. What you're essentially asking for is the state's ability to do the same, which of course would come with a fiscal note that would tell us how much something like this would actually cost. Well, we have a line item in our budget for expert witnesses, so it would come out of our budget. Well, why wouldn't the same be true of the Defender General? It, it is, and they have they have these they have got a line item for expert witnesses as yeah. well. Yeah, so it'd be the I exact know. same. I do their budget. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> uh, right. And what's interesting is that we can actually hire our own our own evaluation for insanity, just not competency. Co let's stop. stop. Help me. <laughs> what? Who said you? Are you referring? Sorry, uh, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner of Carmen Collins. Yeah, Are you referring to the, the Shero 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 case? Yes. So there was, and Judge Pearson can also probably speak a little bit to it, maybe, or maybe not. But uh, <laughs> uh, Shero case uh, is a Supreme Court case that basically, the basic tenets, my understanding of it, not being a lawyer, uh, is that uh, it, you can't compel a defendant uh, to meet with uh, another evaluator beyond the neutral evaluator. Uh, and so once the neutral evaluation's been done, the defense has the right to you know, have their own evaluation, but the state's attorney can't compel that, that, uh, that defendant uh, to uh, engage with another uh, evaluation. 
that defendant yeah, may opt to it. Uh, but, uh, is that a Supreme Court or is yes. it? Yeah. It was, when did they decide that? Like a year, just, a, just over a year ago. It was, is, it a, is it a statutory interpretation? 2017. It's, constitutional? it's a statutory interpretation. Okay. Case. All right, so what you, I need to understand this fully, but so you're telling me that if it's an issue of insanity, you can hire your own witness, your own expert, who would be, but if it's an issue of competency, you can't? That's right. That doesn't make sense. It's just the way the statute was drafted, and they probably were drafted at different times, and... Uh, well, so we should redraft the statute, I would guess. <coughs> Unless there's an objection to redrafting this, I don't know why we wouldn't. You mean, so, if the issue, if, why, uh, maybe, I need, maybe I need a lesson in law, of, you know, in terms of the difference between a competency and an insanity. The person's not competent to stand trial is the question. Is the, excuse me, the question is, is, the individual competent to stand trial. The defense gets to hire their own witness to the to the uh, defendant, and but the state can't hire anybody. Uh, if no, it's a competency the, issue. Uh, what, what happens is that you have to take the the, the Department of Mental Health's um, evaluation. Well, but then that but isn't that the state then? That's technically the neutral evaluation. Right. How many cracks of this apple did you then get? If your expert comes along and says, well, I agree with the neutral and the defense that this person is incompetent. If we open this door, do you get another crack of that 10 months later to see whether or not they've gained competence? Well, there's, I mean, competence is, of course, you know, in the moment. Uh, and uh, if they were then discharged, or if they were then committed to the Department of Mental Health, and if we would want to seek a reevaluation, certainly if if they were being discharged in the Department of Mental Health. If there's an order of non-hospitalization, and there's a person out there who's not currently uh, facing the charge, I'm trying to see how that would pan out sure. in the long the run. Enough. I get the initial finding of incompetence. Right. Um, do we open that, keep that door open until the statute of limitations has expired? It seems to me you could get a number of cracks at the apple to determine if and when this person has regained confidence. confidence. Okay, well, if they were then committed to the Department of Mental Health, I mean, I'd say it would probably be SH. A -R -R it's 205 VT 300. Um, it, I don't necessarily disagree with you. Unfortunately, I got to run next door, but we're opening up a can of worms. If you might want I'm to sure we will. We always do. We, I, I would say we don't never. This is why nothing changes in the mental health field. I mean, we don't. I, mean, I don't mean that. I, 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 I mean that specifically in terms of. The insanity defense and the, not in terms of mental health thing. Can I ask a question? No, I just need to explain myself because I'm on camera. What did you just say? Oh, okay. Uh, I meant in terms yeah. of the insanity plea yeah. and the uh, competency to stand trial and those issues because they get very complex and we never seem to make improvements. And that's what I meant by that statement. I did not mean the Department of Mental Health or any of our designated agencies never do anything right. I think they do a terrific job. So now, now, now you make your now you so I I am confused here I guess because I think we if, all are if so someone is found incompetent to stand trial then they, and then if they're put under the supervision of either on a hospitalization or non-hospitalization. And then they're about to be released. So the Department of Mental Health has, or discharged or whatever the term is, Department of Mental Health has determined that they're no longer in need of, of that treatment. So at that point, why do you, why would you want to have your own 
I, I mean, Mental now health. you can now you can file your charges. We don't know about it though. That's the problem. Is we don't know when they're being discharged. It's a, well, we've added we've added that here. If you add that here, that's a huge step yeah. forward. Uh, I'm talking about you. But then again, your own. mental health isn't isn't determining whether someone's competent or incompetent to stand trial. They're determining whether someone is in need of treatment. Um, and so we would have to seek the competency evaluation. The problem is, is that we yeah. don't have access to the defendant to seek the competency evaluation using our own expert. Because you can't compel them. We can't compel them under the Shero decision the way the um, the way the statute's written. Really, I mean that's what that's it's, they did. It. The Supreme Court just said under the plain language, it says the court can order a competency evaluation through the Department of Mental Health. They, so right, so the just, court could order it, but you can't. That's what you're saying. The court can or the court couldn't order it, a competency evaluation using it, an expert that we pick. No, they have to use an expert right. picked by the Department of Mental Health, right. which is probably where it should be anyway, because they're the Department of Mental Health. I, I mean, but, they're but the ones that are most likely to be able to. Before we get anyway. stale off into the sunset here, <laughs> um, Eric and. Pepper, would you work together to craft some language that we could look at the next time we take this up? Yes, please. Thank and you. we'll look at the Cheryl decision and how that impacts yeah. okay. cases and, and why it should be changed. And then sure. from the defense, I'm sure Matt Valerio or the, the, some other people may wish to argue why it shouldn't be changed. But until I have language in front of me, it's hard to figure out why, mm -hmm. what we might be doing or not doing. Well, what we're even talking about. Well, I think I know what we're talking about, but I, I think that it's hard to follow. Um, that said, I'm going to keep going with this particular version in front of us. Mm -hmm. If there are things that you think need to change in this version or that are concerned to the state's attorneys. Uh, no, I mean, I think that uh, we really appreciate the notice provision. I think that closes a very serious gap. I mean, I don't, and if you add the competency discharges to the discharges that were for competency, that gives us an opportunity to try a case that is still active, honestly. Uh, we just don't know that this person is being discharged. So, no, I think that's a very important step forward. Okay, anything else? Um, um, Morning Fox is the next witness from the Department of Health. And again, the next time we'll take up the, well, I'll call it the Cheryl Amendment or whatever. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We tried to get printed copies of it. Yeah, no problem. For the record, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. I'd like to start by saying, uh, expressing my thanks uh, for this committee for uh, uh, continuing to work on this bill. Uh, I've been following it since its initial inception back this summer, uh, and I've been a supporter of many of the, the tenants here. I, too, agree with the chair that this is a very important topic. Uh, that's something that uh, has uh, uh, been a heavy weight uh, for a long time, and I think it's uh, high time that we start to address some of these issues. Uh, and so I, again, uh, appreciate that. Um, we did, as Ledge Council mentioned, uh, met with uh, uh, Legislative Council uh, earlier this week uh, and are in support of the, the current language around the 10-day uh, uh, prior discharge notice uh, to state's attorneys. Uh, as far as the uh, question around incompetence to stand trial and adding that that language. Uh, my, my first initial thought is I think we'd be okay with that. However, I have a few just caveats to that. Uh, one is uh, when the Department of Mental Health does discharge someone from, say, a hospital level of care, uh, that they're no longer you know, in need of that treatment, or even if we were to uh, determine that someone is not a person in need of treatment or a person in need of continued treatment and are looking to discharge them from the care and custody of the commissioner, uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, reflect that uh, uh, that has a change in their uh, competence uh, to stand trial. Uh, 
and someone's competence to stand trial is not necessarily uh, equate to their need for treatments and, and things of that sort. Uh, on a piece to that, uh, knowing uh, uh, the, the, the Shero decision, that has uh, that has been a barrier uh, at times, and I can appreciate where uh, State's Attorney Pepper, uh, you know, that that opinion comes from. Uh, we have we have uh, seen that that impact uh, as well. Um, in in one sense, uh, uh, the department would also be interested if, in uh, language that uh, allowed for the department uh, once. We feel the department feels that a person has uh, regained competence through through treatment to be able to make that request to the court to have a new evaluation done. Currently, uh, it's it's a request and it may or may not uh, uh, happen. Uh, but if it uh, were to be the department makes a request and it shall happen, uh, that would be something that the department would uh, be in support of. Uh, part of uh, the language in here in the. Uh, the studies, uh, the forensic studies, uh, does speak to a competency restoration program. Uh, and so uh, right now, uh, the state of Vermont does not have a, a, a legislative mandate uh, to uh, restore competence. Uh, and uh, we, as we, as I have spoken in this committee and others uh, over the years, uh, Vermont is an outlier in how we handle uh, forensic cases. Uh, a significant outlier, if I may underline that. Uh, and having a formal competency restoration program is one of those pieces that we are lacking. Uh, and so it's important for us to include that as part of the study uh, so that we understand uh, exactly how that will look, take the information from other areas, uh, but also uh, if there are going to be any uh, fiscal impacts of, of uh, having a uh, competency restoration program. We need to be able to take a look at that and have it with our eyes uh, wide open. Uh, in regards to the study in general, uh, we're open to the members and, and you know, how that, how that gets shaped out. Uh, community members, you know, uh, X number of uh, at-large community members or, you know, other folks, some, some other language I'm sure we can work on crafting uh, to, to satisfy all folks. Uh, we would also suggest uh, the uh, addition of a, uh, an outside consultant uh, to, to come in uh, to, to help organize some of this, uh, this study uh, so that we're not just uh, having kind of the internal conversation, but that we actually bring in uh, out external expertise. Um, this is, and speaking with other national experts recently, uh, these areas, uh, uh, psychiatric security review boards, uh, competency restoration programs, et cetera, uh, the national experts I've spoken with have expressed, you know, that A, yes, Vermont is a very significant outlier, but to be careful and, and thoughtful about how it happens because other states have gone down these roads uh, fairly quickly to try and uh, fix gaps uh, resulting in unintended consequences. Uh, the Department of Mental Health uh, has uh, had to do many studies over the year and so over the years, uh, and so we, we uh, historically now say, please no more studies. Um, but if we do ask for a study, I think, um, committee members should rest assured that we really feel there is a need uh, and uh, and to this end we do feel that there is a need uh, for this study group. Um, another piece of that uh, study group, uh, it talks about uh, um, the mention of uh, looking at uh, evaluating the uh, psychiatric security review boards that uh, as legislative council mentioned uh, exist in a few other states already. Uh, we'd also like to add uh, to that study uh, that the purpose of uh, having a purposeful look at uh, not only the psychiatric security review boards but also the uh, uh, the findings of guilty but mentally ill uh, as as a possible outcome as well uh, uh, from a uh, insanity defense uh, and that uh, taking a look at both those pieces uh, because both of those in their own ways uh, can address some of the, the gaps that have been identified and some of the concerns that that uh, people have had at different times. Uh, in addition, uh, we'd also like to add a few other things to help continue to make this a, a robust uh, uh, bill. Uh, I appreciate uh, the chair's comments that this is a very new bill compared to how it was originally uh, 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 introduced. And so 
uh, you know, many things have been taken out, some things have been added in. We'd like to add even, even just that much more, uh, which would be uh, to consider some language around uh, the Department of Mental Health having party status uh, in criminal cases when competency and sanity become an issue. Uh, the Department of Mental Health uh, and the uh, uh, Attorney General's Office uh, associated with the Department of Mental Health, as well as the Mental Health Law Project, um, uh, have the expertise and knowledge uh, related to uh, the systems uh, and, and individual needs and would be in a better position to inform the courts as to appropriate level of care uh, and you know, uh, issues of, of, of that nature. Uh, one other piece that we'd like to add is that uh, currently uh, when an individual is, is uh, ordered to have a competency and sanity evaluation, uh, the evaluation uh, typically occurs uh, together and the report is one unified report. Uh, actual standards and best practices throughout the, the, the nation uh, are that they are separate. Uh, that competency evaluation occurs first, and then once an individual has been found competent, then the sanity evaluation occurs, uh, that they are separate. The basic concept behind that is, uh, if you're assessing someone's sanity at the time of a crime with someone who's incompetent uh, to stand trial, it, it bears to hold that the information that they're providing to an evaluator around their sanity may not be um, accurate, whole uh, or uh, otherwise uh, influenced by, by the fact that they're actually not competent uh, to, to stand trial and work actively in their own defense. Um, and so uh, those are the pieces that we'd like to be able to, uh, to see added uh, into this and would work with Ledge Council if, if others saw fit uh, to help uh, introduce some of this, this other language. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm happy to have that discussion. I just... <laughs> <laughs> at some point, the Health and Welfare Committee will want to look at this bill, and I'm not sure at what point, but I should. Um, they just told me that. But, oh, okay. Um, Is that where you were? Yeah. But I will. When you say you're proposing to explore. To explore. Guilty but mentally ill. But, We'd like to have that part of the study. Part of the study. To explore, just like we're exploring the psychiatric review board. Because I've heard of you, um, you know, We are waiting for a U.S. Supreme Court decision on the Kansas. Correct. Which did away with the. With the not guilty insanity. by reason of insanity. And, and perhaps we should be exploring that as well. Yes, I would agree. Yeah. Or, or at least I mean, you know, assuming following the Supreme that Supreme Court. Court following that Supreme Kansas Court. Kansas is okay. Exactly. We'd have which to. would come. Yes, we we know that before October. Well, you know, don't they have? Yeah. So, yeah. If there was a study of that, we'd, we'd at least you know put that in. Fair. If we're gonna do yes. guilty but mentally ill, we're gonna do you know just do away with it. Um, looking at all of the ideas. I know um, it's unusual for the department to. Enthusiastically support studies, and I know they're hard on exactly. All of you, so we appreciate that. Um, and to, just to be clear, too, uh, in our request to, to study guilty but mentally ill, it's not our request to consider the removal of the, the insanity plea. Uh, but I do agree with well, the chair I, that we I should should be aware at, of what the Supreme know, Court decides. If we don't add looking at it, the U.S. Supreme Court agrees with Kansas. Yes. Then there'll be certain moves in that direction as well. I'm so sure that there will be prepared about why you don't want to do it or why you want to. Um, other comments or questions for morning talks? Thank you very much for making it in today. And, uh, <laughs> I guess we have. Wait for other members of your judicial attention. <laughs> you canceled tonight? No, we didn't. No. Oh, oh, we didn't. You're just gonna go on without the wimps. We're canceling one judge who has to come from Bennington. Well, that's understandable. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the wimps at Bennington? <laughs> well, 
Let me just explain this about that. I'm telling you, there's something in the water down there. If my dog couldn't go to dog's daycare, the dog can't make it up here. You know, when, when they close doggy daycare, so yeah, poor Marley's not able to go to doggy day camp today. I mean, he's bummed. He actually likes the snow. Oh, he loves the snow, but yeah. you know, the dog park is yeah, open to him. And We're he could go for day, uh, for morning thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. We look forward to the next iteration. Iteration. <laughs> iteration. <laughs> It'll grow back again. Um, David Shirk, did you want to testify? Well, I wasn't on the list, but I, you know there were some comments made that yeah. Might yeah. Well, after David, sure. If you, sure. If you can stick around for him. Yes. Thank you, <clears throat> David Chair with the Attorney General's Office. I just have a, a some brief comments. We are largely in support of what we are in support of what the uh, state's attorneys proposed, and I know we're going to talk more about that at a future date when we have language in front of us. So I won't spend more time on that. One piece that he didn't mention that. Uh, Attorney Pepper didn't mention was we would like to make sure that the AG's office is added to the um, notice provision on page three of the bill, um, which provides that notice will be given to the state's attorney of the county where the prosecution originated. We would just want to be sure that uh, sometimes those prosecutions are handled by the attorney general's office, and we want to make sure that we are in there in case we are the ones who are handling the prosecution. So that's really... Did you get notice of all of them or just the ones where you've been the prosecutor? I mean, I think it makes sense to have it, following the pattern of what's there right now, to have it be the ones where we've been a prosecutor. I don't no, see you don't, a need. You wouldn't need a case from Bennington or uh, Eric and Rogers, for example. Uh, no, I don't think we need that notice. If they want to communicate with us, they always can. I don't think we need separate notice on that. But just to make sure that it's provided for explicitly that when we were the prosecuting agency, that is in there. And that's that was actually all I had to say today. I think uh, I was ready to discuss a little bit more, but you had a good discussion with Attorney Pepper, and we'll follow up on that later. Uh, well, I'm going to ask you another question. The difference between notice and medical reasons that a person can't stand trial are coming up more and more lately. We've got a case in Bennington. It's not mental illness, but it's the, the person says they're terminal and a trial will kill them. And then we've seen these cases in other states now. Um, are this, is this going to be the, the new normal? Or? I would hesitate to make predictions on that. Um, you know, I obviously can't speak about specific cases that we're working on right now. I think. Uh, it, I, I think you're right about the trend, and I think we'll have to see if that become if, if that trend continues. I'm not sure I would see. You know, just thinking out loud, I'm not sure. I that, though I think those things will always have to be dealt with on a case by case basis, and judges are going to have to make case by case determinations. Um, but we'll see if this becomes a larger issue that we have to address. Okay. Um, one other yeah, when I saw. Harvey Weinstein walking in in the walker, and then he climbs the stairs, and somebody holds the walker, and then he takes the walker again. I'm saying, you know, this is, you know, either can't climb the stairs or can't. There's elevators. Um, and then we have the case in Bennington. I know you don't want to talk about it, but it's in the press all the time about the guy from Florida who's been dying for 21 years. Okay, uh, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Judge Gerson, I'm not going to ask you about Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I wouldn't have much to offer on that score anyway. Uh, for the record, Brian Gerson, Chief Superior Judge. I wasn't listed as a witness, but I was listening to the comments both by uh, Pepper and, and Morning Fox. Um, and one of the things that was brought up was this the, the idea of restoration services that I understand would be part of a study. Um, and Morning made the comment that we're kind of an outlier. And I, I just wanted to inform the committee that uh, last fall I was at a conference uh, involving trial judges from around the country. And with any luck, I'll, I'll be going back to one uh, later this month 
around this very issue. And the other, there were about 10 of us there, trial judges, and they were from Phoenix and Baltimore and uh, Brooklyn, uh, Los Angeles, and I was like the country mouse uh, and, the, and the city mouse. What was interesting was that every single one of them was talking about the issue surrounding these restoration services. Uh, we were the only <coughs> state there, and I was there to represent the, the rural states, that went from criminal process to civil process on issues around competency and hospitalization. All the other states that were represented there keep the cases in the criminal process. And if someone is found incompetent, when they start talking about restoration services, at least my understanding of the discussion was that they're talking about restoring services so that they return to competency. The issue for them, and when you're looking at this issue, it's not just what do we have to do um, procedurally around it, but the real issue for them is where do we put these folks while they're being restored to competency because it's the old age-old discussion of, well, if they're mentally ill, um, we're not going to put them in prison, and the hospitals didn't want them. So they were all seemed to be struggling with this issue of where do these folks go in the interim? So it's not enough to say, okay, we're going to put into play restoration services. You've got to go to the next step and say, where are, if, you, if you go that route, where are they going to be uh, as you're trying to restore competency? Um, and so I, I hope to be able to go back and continue that discussion uh, with them um, because obviously it's now more topical than uh, I had. I was the only one at the table that said, well, we don't have that concept until I came back and realized that it was now being discussed. So um, it, it, it's certainly an issue all around, all around the country. It's not anything new, but the real question for those states mm -hmm. is where, where, do, where do these folks go? Um, and like anything else, it's, it's a resource issue. So that was one thing I wanted the committee to be aware of. Um, I, I would join in um, the uh, comments by DMH around having them become a party uh, at a certain point in the criminal proceedings. And it, in my view anyway, it would not be at the stage where we determine competency or incompetency. It's once we have found someone to be incompetent the next phase is this hospitalization or non-hospitalization hearing. That's where I think they could play a much larger role along with the, um, uh, the uh, mental health defenders, Jack McCullough, um, because at that point the focus becomes treatment as opposed to punishment. Um, I think even if they were at the table at that point, uh, I know there were many times when we were struggling in the, in the criminal court when we had somebody that was incompetent, needed, didn't need to be hospitalized, but the issue of what services and treatment they needed, uh, in, even in the community setting, was difficult for either the state's attorney and or the public defender to identify those resources where we would contact them. I think you could still leave the state's attorney at the table um, because they obviously have a voice in the public safety issues, but at the same time bring in of the Department of Mental Health at that hospitalization or non-hospitalization <coughs> hearing. I think it could be important. And if you remember, that was in a bill a few years ago as a result of, a, mm -hmm. I'll say, another year-long study that recommended exactly that. And it almost made it through uh, both houses. I think it got through the house, but I, I don't know. It was at the end of the session. So that, that has been discussed, and it was close to it. Um, well, Looks, I was going to schedule a vote on this bill next week, but it looks like that's unrealistic. Um, I guess we'll go back to the drawing board and add some things to it. And I, and I think what the committee was hearing from Pepper about the issue of further competency, in, in most cases, when someone is found incompetent as they move to the next stage, in most cases, those cases are dismissed without prejudice. It's only in, well, for lack of a better term, on the high profile, this the serious so dumb way to deal with where the cases are left open. Allow them to be dismissed without prejudice based upon the okay. failure to, uh, because they're not competent to stand trial. Right. So, so when they are competent, they'd be able to be tried. Right. And so with the notice provisions you're putting in, if the, even if the case was dismissed 
without prejudice earlier on, once the notice comes back, the person is no longer meeting treatment, it may trigger uh, the state's attorney to say, in this particular case, we're going to refile, and they could then ask for the neutral evaluation of competency Senator, again. I've never taken it this far, but since we're opening this prospective door, the person is found incompetent and hospitalized and is later found to be competent. Are they getting credit for time served in wherever we place them? I, I'm not aware that issue has ever been raised, but um, well, I, much, if much you like extend the door. I mean, giving them separate cracks of the apple as time goes on to, to eventually arrive at a place where that person is competent. In the meantime, we've hospitalized them. Um, I think there's an argument to be made that they've technically done. It, it may something. be without. I haven't given it much thought, but. It, Consistent with what we've been doing over the last few years with treatment, uh, pre -plea, uh, treatment credit and treatment credit, it may be that this is a further discussion. That's a good point, but then actually you could have situations where the person is hospitalized for a long period of time, might have well extended whatever the sentence might be. Um, so, so I just if anybody's got proposals stuff. for changes, if they could get them to Eric or Katie. If it's study, probably Katie. Did. Get them to Eric and Katie. Uh, send them to both of them, please. Um, and then they can decide who's going to do what. Uh, but your proposals would probably get to both of them if you could send them to us. And um, thank you. Did you have anything else? No, just wanted um, to share those. those. So we'll take this up either next week or the following week.